So now as the slides are coming into uh, view, we want to uh, welcome uh, John Hewlett to uh, introduce risk and give us a, a, an overview of uh, understanding risk in agriculture. So John, with that, I will turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and appreciate the opportunity to give uh, a little perspective on a module we've been putting together on risk in agriculture. Hopefully we have a, a little bit different uh, angle on that than, than you uh, may be a little more familiar with standard presentations. Uh, this module has a number of different components that uh, it addresses. Uh, you can see the list of uh, sections uh, on the screen there covering everything from a general description of what is risk uh, to how uh, risky choices might be evaluated in making decisions and how to include risk uh, when making those decisions and so on. Um, it's one of, again, a number of different um, courses and, and modules we have put together over the years, but this one, uh, we're digging in a little bit deeper on some components uh, of the risk and how it affects the decision maker then in some of the other efforts. Uh, so. Uh, let's just go ahead and get started. We're going to try to quickly move through these various segments. Um, I'll be taking the first four, and then uh, Dr. Parsons will be uh, hitting on the last three as far as how we're dividing it up this morning. And so we're going to start off with what is risk, and uh, clearly uh, many of us who are involved in, in working with uh, producers or if we're involved in uh, actual production agriculture, we know about risk only too well. Uh, and it is a, a major focus of a lot of uh, educational efforts these days, whether we're in extension or even uh, other kinds of related businesses working with ag producers. So it's clearly a factor. But the thing I guess is kind of interesting to do a little reading and background uh, research on the topic in a, in a little broader context is that although risk is part of nearly everyone's daily life, few of us are trained to evaluate risk alternatives in any kind of a formal way. In fact, one expert on risk says that societies around the world generally lack risk literacy, and members of those societies are generally not what he would call risk savvy. And even further compound the challenge then, uh, people when faced with risk alternatives tend to think that complex problems require complex solutions, and unfortunately with risk, the opposite is sometimes or maybe often true that simple rules can not only help to clarify the choices open to us, but also make the consequences more obvious. So this can help make uh, us a little more risk savvy and in making better choices in the face of that unknown future that we all more or less face in, in one way or another in our daily lives. In addition to further compound those problems, much of the information provided by many different trusted sources, such as doctors, lawyers, politicians, or even bankers, is often inaccurate, uh, maybe incomplete or incorrectly portrayed because those individuals that are involved in giving that information are unclear about what the practical implications are of that risk uh, in regards to the decisions that we're facing. So if we look a little more closely at risk and how that unknown future might be affected by risk, there are basically two different factors that are separate and distinct that influence that. The first is variability, and the second is uncertainty. So what do we mean by that? Well, variability is used to refer to alternative or different outcomes in the future that are due to the effects of chance whereas uncertainty refers to the decision maker's lack of knowledge about the future. It may even represent an uncertainty about the meaning of current events and what they may imply for future outcomes. And of course, when we turn to agriculture, we're probably all familiar with these five main sources of risk that we've been talking about now for the last <laughs> decade or, or more in terms of where risk may influence our business, anywhere from market and price risk to production risk, um, which we are most familiar with, and then uh, institutional risk or, or uh, legal risk, as some have called it, uh, human resource risk and financial risk. And we've certainly got other materials that dig into these further, but uh, in the interest of time, we'll just move on now to, the, to sort of the implications about those sources of risk for our business. 
we begin addressing that in the section with uh, with the title does risk matter and it may be important as we start that type of discussion and thinking about that to point out that not all risk actually matters some of it doesn't affect us some of that variability or uncertainty uh, doesn't influence our business or it doesn't doesn't affect us in a large enough way that we need to take it into consideration. Risk does matter, however, where management objectives are not being met, cannot be met, or where control is lost due to the variability of the outcomes. This could happen where a manager does not have a risk management plan that is designed to limit losses, where the cost of managing the risk is judged too high, or the likelihood of occurrence is evaluated as too low. In addition, the business will likely not move forward where objectives are not met. So even more to the point, profitability will likely suffer or may be lost and could potentially threaten the future of the business. And so one of the key points here is identifying the objectives to accomplish are part of properly framing a decision, especially regarding risk management. Why would that be important? Well, because the objectives form the decision criteria. They help to determine what the information is that needs to be sought out or further research that needs to be accomplished and can help explain uh, the decision choices to others, as well as help determine how how important the decision is to the people that are involved uh, and including the timing and effort that should be spent in making that decision. So not all risks should be managed, especially those that don't matter, obviously, but the risks that should be managed are those when the management objectives become more uncertain or where the consequences of a bad or negative outcome become larger in potential effect, less known or perhaps less knowable, and certainly that happens in cases where the choices are less clear or the alternatives are not well understood and the chance then of a substantial threat is increased. Or possibly in the case where negative consequences become more frequent. So understanding that certain risks may not need to be looked at, uh, but others do when we decide we need to manage a risk, what would we need to do? So can the risk be managed? And certainly uh, some are more manageable than others. So if we turn to that question and and, uh, think about it in kind of a broad context, we would argue that risk management can be defined as taking some kind of deliberate action to shape the variability of the outcomes, shape the consequences, or to shape both for any particular management decision that might be made. So the effort to manage risk can be applied at several different levels within a business. At the highest level or the strategic level, management makes decisions regarding the allocation of resources across the business activities, the timing of the application of those resources, and the level of the resource use. At the next level down, decisions are made regarding how those resources will be applied within the individual profit center or the enterprise. In this way, risk management decisions can be and often are made at both the strategic and the enterprise or division level of management. Obviously, the management of the various risks faced by the business is best accomplished where the risk strategies adopted are well coordinated across all levels of management and are in agreement with the risk management objectives of the business in general. So risk management might be said, it might be described as a necessary but sometimes frustrating activity. Even very good risk management strategies can still lead to a bad outcome due to the uncertainty of how the future will actually turn out. So as a result, the quality of a risk management strategy should be judged based on the information available at the time the strategy is selected and not solely on the final result. Although results are obviously important, even high quality risk management strategies don't come with guarantees in the face of significant uncertainty. So good strategies should lead to more positive results more consistently, we might hope. Now the next question we take up and one where we dig down a little further in this particular module are the challenges to managing risk. And there are many, we're just gonna brush over the high points of several of them here, 
But one of those uh, we've already kind of mentioned in terms of the human side of that unknown future. Clearly, how risk is understood and a manager's reaction to that situation plays into the risk management responses that they might be willing to consider. The risk attitude might be thought of as a chosen response to variability and uncertainty. It is influenced certainly by changes in perception about a set of alternatives, by gaining new information and or through a shift in their, the manager's emotions. And I guess to be honest, uh, those attitudes we should recognize are in fact shaped by perception and understanding, and they're also shaped by our emotions. So feelings, moods, and temperament at a particular moment all influence our outlook and our chosen response. So when considering our strategy for managing variability and uncertainty in the future, we do well then acknowledge that we not only can be, but likely are influenced by our emotions. So a manager's response to variability and uncertainty is shaped by many, often conflicting signals and factors. However, in most cases, those influences cause the individual or the business to act. Uh, that is to say, they influence the chosen behavior of the person or the company. And sometimes that choice is a choice to do nothing. <laughs> However, even doing nothing is a choice selected from several alternatives and results in certain consequences, whether they be judged good or bad by the individual involved. Taking a little different slant on that, it's been said that humans only learn by making mistakes, but don't learn much from success. Often the goodness or badness of a situation and our fear of those two alternatives when we think about the future cause us to act or react without even consciously thinking about it. So uh, good errors, we might think of our mistakes that need to be made through some sort of process of trial and error modeling, or even learning from other people's mistakes. Decision makers can learn from such an approach and not, not only to refine their capacity to weigh alternatives, but also to make selections uh, for alternatives that they think better fit themselves. Bad errors, on the other hand, are mistakes in judgment or perception of a situation. And bad errors are those that don't actually lead to learning or refinement of the decision makers' capacity to function better into the future. We move then to think a little further about risk and how it influences our thinking. Aversion to the unknown is certainly a human trait. Most people, including business managers, would prefer certainty over variability and uncertainty. In many cases, uh, and in across many aspects of their lives, so individuals with a high need for certainty are referred to as risk averse. Such individuals focus a great deal of their attention on planning things out and are confused when things are ambiguous and are unclear. Uh, for some people, risk aversion stems from a fear or even anxiety over making errors. Either they dread the unknown consequences should they make a poor choice, or they might be afraid of making the wrong choice or instinctively want to avoid situations where they don't have control. Some people are motivated by a mortal fear of what's called shame. They may try to limit the unknown in their lives as much as possible in order to avoid shame and the disgrace that they anticipate that goes along with it. In other cases, it seems the manager is trying to manage by making as few management decisions as possible. Instead, this type of manager lets the circumstances of the day dictate the terms of how business plays out and attempts to point fingers at outside forces and factors as the culprit for the failure. Now, a whole another gamut of, of things to consider beyond risk aversion is one of bias. And it has received a lot of attention by researchers and, and uh, folks looking into risk. Uh, in fact, there are different sources of bias that we would probably all recognize that influence our consideration of alternative decisions. Uh, one source indicates or lists as many as 188 cognitive biases that can or do shape how we view the challenges of an unknown future, as uh, listed or described on that diagram on the screen. Uh, these biases, whether they're explicit or implicit, can and do influence our perception of risk. 
And there are apparently two conflicting views about bias and how it may play out in daily decision making. One camp suggests that biases are failures of the human computational machine, if you will. Emotions and other human factors uh, lead managers to make poor decisions due to a lack of time, maybe unfamiliarity with the analytic approaches that are required, or they lack knowledge of how to conduct the appropriate analysis. On the other side, a second group of researchers hold the view that biases and the human response to complex difficult to analyze situations allow us to have a response even when analysis would be difficult or not possible. Those responses can be devised in a timely manner and without significant expense. However, the lack of analysis may lead to decisions that have less than desirable outcomes. Now, of course, it's possible that both groups are correct and clearly not possible to have all the information the decision maker would like to have ready every time a decision must be made. To do so would obviously be extremely expensive and would require too much time and data collection and analysis. On the other hand, to suggest that the best decisions are those made by the seat of the pants are also not very realistic. There is clearly a place for well-conceived analysis to contribute to good decision uh, making and management decisions. So that that addressing um, questions in a, in a more quick and, and uh, perhaps less analytical way is sometimes referred to as heuristics. Uh, so here, heuristics are a general decision-making strategy that people use when they have to make frequent decisions or that where there isn't much time to make the decision. Uh, they're often or commonly known as rules of thumb. They help avoid long drawn out analysis of alternatives that may require data collection from various sources and lengthy analysis in order to reach a decision. Now, often, heuristics and the course of action they suggest are not well understood, perhaps even by the individual. In fact, the person may simply explain that a certain option just feels right, or that their intuition suggests one choice is preferred over another. An everyday example of a heuristic might be uh, we think of someone trying to cross a busy city street in two-way traffic where there are no stoplights or crosswalks. To accomplish this without being hit, the pedestrian doesn't make detailed measurements or elaborate calculations. They simply gauge the speed of oncoming traffic and judge when it's best to step off the curb based on an internal heuristic, if you will. Of course, our pedestrian also has the option of changing their own speed or even stopping in response to the changing conditions. But we might say that those heuristics that we have, that we all often use, allow us as decision makers to ignore some of the data to make a better decision. You might even think of it as an unconscious intelligence. Now, although it's tempting to dismiss this kind of an approach as irrational or unscientific, heuristics have in fact been shown by many authors to be a more effective and rational method for making decisions when time is short, when data is not readily available, or that there may be many different alternatives to choose from and not enough time to, to do the necessary analysis, or there might be a high degree of uncertainty in the situation, and in which case uh, the heuristic can be helpful in making that decision but we should recognize can also be a source of bias and influence the alternatives that we might even be willing to consider, let alone which one we actually choose. So although we probably all often use heuristics, they don't always result in the best choice. So when it comes to risk and the highly subjective nature of the process used to select between alternatives, heuristics are formed from biases that shape our outlook attitudes, as well as our feelings regarding a set of alternative actions, and the underlying uncertainty that may accompany each one of the options that we're thinking about. So in general, one of the biggest hurdles to good risk management uh, decision making is the separation of variability from uncertainty. Insights into the correct approach for evaluating the alternatives available can be gained where the manager is able to sort the unknown future into variability or that uh, change or variation due to chance and on the other side uncertainty 
that is due to lack of knowledge about the future and possibly apply new or additional management effort where it's needed. In the case where a manager does not do that, he'll basically have only a clouded view of that future where the two main, those two factors remain mixed and little understood. So that is kind of where we'll leave off in terms of my presentation and now shift to Dr. Parsons' treatment of the last three segments of the course.